Okay. Bacon's Rebellion, Part 2. Um, as I said, we're going to talk uh, about the issues involved. So, Indians, a class conflict, and a, uh, well, a race issue. But we'll get to that. Um, first, is this was very obviously an Indian war. Bacon was, and these small farmers on the frontier were being attacked by Indians, and they were attacking Indians. Well, we have this image that after Jamestown and Pocahontas and John Smith are all very lovey-dovey, that there's no problems. Well, turns out that's not true. In 1622, Opa Canoe, this is Palatan's brother, takes over after Palatan dies. Um, he launches an invasion that kills 347 Englishmen. That is one third of the entire population of Virginia. It is a huge blow, excuse me, the entire European population. Um, in 1644, 22 years later, he comes back and kills 400 Englishmen. Um, now, the problem is, over that 22 years, the English population grew, and 400 really isn't a significant number. It's like 120th of the population of Virginia. All right. But, the other thought was after 1644, the native uh, population wasn't a real threat. There wasn't a real problem. You didn't have this conflict. Yet we see in Bacon's Rebellion that clearly there is a conflict. Clearly, the Englishmen are moving further and further out on the frontier, infringing on native territory, and the native are retaliating back, causing a major kind of political issue. Uh, well, a rebellion, if you will. Um, the second thing we know involves class, because what we see is these small farmers on the frontier turn their attention from the natives to not just Governor Berkeley, but the entire plantation elite who surrounds him. Um, the people who are essentially controlling government. You see, those small farmers on the frontier are in kind of the, the little rockier soil. The people in charge of the government are actually along the rivers, along the James River, along the Rappahannock River, along the Potomac River, along the York River, right down in this really kind of area we call a sandy loam. It's this really great soil. It's this flat area, perfect for growing tobacco. Um, and they were the first ones there. And they were wealthy, and they were controlling society. Now, these plantation elite were very concerned with uh, having the latest styles and building a big home and having kind of the fancy plantation idea that, that kind of that you think of today. Um, they also acquired what we call deference of everyone around them. Um, there was a situation where if you came to them and you needed help, you needed to trade your tobacco through them, or you needed a loan, they would give it to you out of the kindness of their heart. But you must show respect or deference to them in which you vote for them, you respect them as the elders, you kind of treat them like royalty, almost. Because what these guys were trying to do is create that kind of English nobility society, that old serfdom, Middle Ages kind of society in the New World. Um, and what we see is there was a significant conflict between these kind of plantation elite, which you would think of as a large plantation owner, and these small farmers on the frontier. Um, okay. Part three is a little different. Part three is the racial issue. Um, now, slave trade began earlier, right? Uh, the first slaves who actually came in arrived in 1619. A Dutch ship dropped them off at Jamestown. Um, but what we see is that slavery was not a real significant institution until about 1700. Um, because at first, a so indentured servant you could buy for seven years. The life expectancy was about eight to ten years. A slave is three to four times the cost of an indentured servant. So why would you buy a slave that's going to only live ten years when you can buy an indentured servant that you have for seven years for a third of the price? You don't. You buy the indentured servant or you rent the identity system, however you want to talk about it. Um, so, the one thing, I'm sorry, um, 
here's a story. A guy named Anthony Johnson. Now, Anthony Johnson lived on what we call the Eastern Shore. If you look at Virginia, you got most of Virginia here, you got the Chesapeake Bay, and then you've got this little peninsula that comes down. We call it, uh, uh, we call it the Eastern Shore. Right at the bottom of that, a guy named Anthony Johnson lived about 1650 to about 1680. He was extremely wealthy. He owned hundreds of acres. Um, he sued people. He was sued by people. Um, he owned over 250 slaves. And he was a black man born in Africa. It's not something we usually expect. Try this on for size. 1622, like 40 years later, right? These things called slave codes were passed. Well, let me read you some of these to give you an idea. Um, they said blacks couldn't bear arms. Blacks cannot educate. Blacks cannot marry. Blacks cannot congregate. Blacks cannot own land. Blacks cannot sue. Blacks cannot testify in court. Blacks cannot administer medicine. And they used the term black. So it didn't just apply to slave. It applied to anybody of African heritage. Um, most of these people were born in Africa. We're only kind of maybe one generation in on some of these people at this point. Um, but what happened from the time when Anthony Johnson can be a wealthy slave owner testifying in court, suing people, owning a lot of slaves himself, and to where he had no rights? Well, the secret, in my mind, is Bacon's Rebellion. Racism in the South actually grew out of Bacon Rebellion. Now, I'm not talking um, racialized slavery. Clearly, that was existed. But the concepts of racism that we know and associate with the South today. Let me explain. One thing I didn't tell you is that Bacon's army was made up of small farmers, white indentured servants, black indentured servants, and African slaves. All of the lower classes. Now these gentry saw this, and they saw these lower classes rising up against them, and they were against them. And they realized they needed to do something to stop this. What's the best way to do this? Divide these groups in some way. And so they did. What you see is directly after 1675, within just a couple years, you see all this talk, and all these publications, and all these articles in the newspaper about the dangers of slave rebellion. You don't really see them much before this. Um, now, we know there were slave rebellions going on in the Caribbean all the time, on these sugar plantations. Um, these people would rise up, constant militias were kept on these uh, kind of Caribbean islands to put these down. Uh, we do know 1639 in South Carolina, there's going to be a thing called the Stono Rebellion. 20 slaves are going to rise up, steal some guns. A uh, hundred more slaves are going to kind of join them. They're going to burn seven plantations and kill 20 white plantation owners. So there is something to it. But what we get in the talk is almost an irrational fear, kind of an instilled fear by these gentry that a slave rebellion is going to happen. And the idea is you take these small white farmers, and these white indentured servants. And if you make them fear all the African slaves and the black indentured servants and what they might do, then you separate these two groups. You instill a sense of racism to control your position. Anyways, that's my theory on it. You can play with it. We'll deal with slavery. See you next week.